Hello everyone, thanks for coming back to my channel. Today I'm going to be focusing on the postpartum woman. I've also combined um, nursing care of the postpartum woman and the postpartum woman with complications. So three chapters in today's lecture. Let's get started. Okay, here we are, chapters 15, 16, and 22 from our textbook. When we're talking about the postpartum period, we are talking about the period of time from the delivery of the placenta all the way through six weeks. And some um, books and references will refer to this as the fourth trimester. So you also may hear the term purpurium. This is um, means the same thing as postpartum. It's just an older term. And really, this is when the mother and all of the family members are adjusting to this new family member. And lots of physiological and psychological changes are happening for everyone. So the uterus is going to start to move back down and become a pelvic organ again um, at about the day of, you know, one day postpartum, give and take a little bit, you're going to start to see this uterus moving down um, underneath the umbilicus. And we actually measure it to make sure that it is continuing its path down this way. And it's measured in the amount of finger widths away from the umbilicus that you are um, assessing it. And we'll go into that in more detail in just a minute. The um, nursing management, we're looking for risk factors, uh, looking for our vital signs and deviations away from what's normal. So again, you have to know what's normal and understand to understand what's not normal. And then our goal, our role is early intervention. We certainly want, um, fix my, pointer here. So we certainly want to be able to intervene early, early, early um, and help this mom get back to her pre-labor state. So ambulation, self-care, that sort of thing. If she's had any um, interventions like cesarean section or possibly even epidural, we want to make sure that she is safe to return to her pre-labor state, like say with ambulation, before we let her go off on her own and try to do those things. And then our big, big role in this period, in this fourth trimester is educate. We want to teach her the signs and symptoms that she's going to report herself, how to take care of herself, um, talk about feeding this new little person that's completely dependent on her and point her to community resources. This is going to be essential because everything she's going to need to know is not going to be able to um, be taught to her in the 24 to 48 hours that she remains in the hospital. So typically the assessments, and this is going to depend on your facility, but typically your assessments are going to be uh, for the first two hours. It's recommended every 15 minutes. So that's both mother and baby. And then during the first 24 hours, um, we're after that initial period of two hours, we're going to be looking at them um, somewhere between every three to four hours. And then depending on the policy, that may actually stretch out to a little bit further. Every time you come in contact with a newborn, you're going to be doing your just basic assessments. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the newborn. So our vital sign assessment, sometimes we will see a slight temperature elevation, a slight, not above 100.4 into the fever, but we might see slight into the 99s, and that's not uncommon. The pulse is going to be somewhere 40 to 80 beats per minute. Remember, she's lost some blood, so we're going to see a little bit of a decrease in that volume. If we have a pulse that's outside of this range, especially if it's moving up, we are concerned that her body's trying to compensate for excessive blood loss. We'll talk more about that as we talk about hemorrhage. Respiration should be in the normal range. Blood pressure, blood pressure should be normal for her. If she had a little bit elevated blood pressure before delivery, she may continue to have elevated blood pressures for a short period of time. And then we want to get her pain back down to the zero to two. We don't allow those higher pain levels to... Um, continue on in the postpartum period because labor is over. And even though we do have some discomforts with contractions and pain down below um, from tears or, or just the birth process, 
we want to try to get that pain goal down uh, as much as we can and help her with that. So here's your fundal assessment. Now, a lot of people were taught that you need to do a fundal massage after each um, when you're doing this fundal assessment. And actually what they recommend is just a gentle assessment to determine where the fundus, the top of the uterus is. And so you're going to put a little bit of pressure with your hand down below to support that uterus. And then you're going to use the top of your other hand to determine where we are in relationship to that umbilicus, like I said before. Now, if she's excessively bleeding or if it feels foggy or if it's deviated to the right or the left, then yes, we are going to massage to make sure that we are um, uh, expelling all those clots and helping it to um, firm back down. But you don't have to do a vigorous massage when you're simply doing an assessment. Here are the different um, uh, pads. And so of course, we're talking about a large pad. This is not a panty liner. Uh, this is if you're referring to it as light, moderate, and heavy. Heavy is when you're saturating that pad in less than an hour. And again, these are the large pads. And um, this is just another depiction of what it looks like in this first few days. It's dark red with clots and then gradually moves to a lighter color. If at any point it goes back to dark red, that's a warning sign. And we need to educate the mom that she needs to have that looked at. Now, modern day is we're going to weigh these pads, at least for the first two hours. So after delivery and for the first two hours, we're going to be weighing this and determine the amount of volume of blood loss rather than just looking at it. But as um, education for the mom, this is um, something that we wanna to talk to her about before she goes home so she knows what to report. We're also going to be assessing her perineum. Here's another acronym. You know, we like our acronyms. This is RITA, and this is looking for redness, edema, ecchymosis, bruising, discharge, and approximation. Are those um, edges staying together? So our postpartum assessment, we're always looking at um, uh, her perineum, looking for that episiotomy, looking for any tearing, for hematoma formation, which looks like a bruise developing under the skin, can be very firm to the touch and they will complain of extreme pain when this is developing and it is um, an emergency and needs to be taken care of right away. And then hemorrhoids. So the uterus is called involution and that's the contractions of those muscle fibers um, expelling the rest of the lochia, that uterine lining that's on the inside. And occasionally it's I mean, eventually it's going to go back to its pre-pregnancy size and, and place in the body. The cervix, if you were to look at it, now has a appearing as a jagged slit-like opening that also will um, never completely look like it did before baby had, has uh, come through that area, but it will uh, heal. And then the vagina, eventually you're going to have thickening and the return of the rugae, which is the, the uh, wrinkles along the wall. And then the perineum, it, it may be stretched or bruised or possibly even torn and sore, and that will heal in the next few weeks as well. We wanna give good education about making sure that moms wait their full six weeks before returning to any sexual activity. That includes tampons, any douching they might do, any devices, anything, um, nothing needs to go into the vagina for six weeks. The other thing that we are assessing physically, um, looking at her bladder, is she able to void? Is she voiding completely? Sometimes that's the last thing that will come back after an epidural. And so we wanna make sure that the bladder is able to be emptied because if not, it may interfere with the uterus clamping down and expelling um, those clots that can actually fill up and um, contribute to a hemorrhage if this bladder is not able to be emptied. Bowel sounds, we're going to be watching for that very closely, especially after a um, cesarean section. We need bowel sounds be before we can start feeding this mom because we want to avoid another complication such as an ileus. Again, we're going to be looking at the lochia, the bleeding that's happening, the amount, the color, any odor, we're watching her extremities to look for um, excessive swelling, edema in those extremities, and then very much her emotional status. It is not uncommon for women to be, have very labile emotions after delivery. 
Um, these are some of our, our emotional status assessment. How is she interacting with family? Is she independent? Is she able, is she, does she have a desire to be independent and care for herself and care for her baby? Is she having good eye contact with her newborn? How is her comfort level? Some women have never been around newborns before and we have to help her become comfortable um, caring for her baby. It will help her to be more confident as she goes home. And we want to be watching for extreme mood swings, irritability, and crying episodes. Um, this is common in the first couple of days. We expect it and maybe even prepare her and her partner that if she has this big hormone shift, as she it, um, suffers from being exhausted after the birth and then now up through the night caring for this newborn, she may see more of that and it's perfectly acceptable. We'll talk about when it becomes outside of the norm. Her urinary system is going to adapt if she's had any lacerations, especially if they move up into the urethra, that could affect how well she's able to empty her bladder. She might have swelling and bruising. So we want to make sure she is able to empty that bladder. So we're going to measure that first urine when she gets up to the bathroom. She also may have a diminished sensation due to swelling or numbness, as I mentioned before. So we're going to be um, paying close attention to how well she is able to void. Um, it is not uncommon for women to have large amounts of diuresis, sweating, getting rid of that excess fluid through the skin. So what causes it? Um, first of all, it's a fluid shift. There's an antidiuretic effect of oxytocin, both natural and synthetic. We, um, there's a buildup of the extra fluids during pregnancy. And then we pumped her full of fluid, most likely during labor. Um, depending on the type of anesthesia she used, she may have had even more. Uh, this is one of those things that we still routinely do for women. It's not um, supported by the evidence, but we routinely do it. And then somehow these moms have to get rid of all that excess fluid. So that contributes to the diuresis. Her GI system is going to have some adaptations. Now she has a lot more room. There's the relief from the baby being um, no more pressure from the baby on the organs. We might see decreased bowel tones for several days, but um, if she's had a vaginal delivery, maybe not. There is decreased peristalsis and that's related to um, both or her delivery type. So if she had a cesarean section that will increase decreased peristalsis. If we're giving her narcotic pain medication, that will decrease the peristalsis and then the hormones uh, uh, contribute to decreased peristalsis. So we want to give her good education about how to avoid constipation. It's, it's a common problem after delivery. So things like water, making sure she's eating a high fiber diet, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, all very important, and a stool softener will help um, avoid that constipation. Uh, here's a nursing tip. If you are giving any sort of narcotic pain relief, um, oral narcotic pain relief after delivery, it needs to be accompanied with a stool softener. We should never be giving those two things um, without each other after a delivery. And then hunger and thirst are going to occur right away. She just ran a marathon. She, um, we are still keeping patients NPO after delivery, and that can contribute to um, them just feeling starving. Again, another one of those things that we routinely do that is not based on current evidence, but that evidence practice gap is definitely apparent in labor and delivery. So the joints are gonna to return to pre-pregnancy state. Um, they, women common, commonly experience fatigue because they've just, like I said, run a marathon, and then those abdominal muscles may um, take some time to tone back up. Integumentary system, that pigmentation that happened on the skin, um, called that colosma, it will eventually fade. If she had any of the Linnea nigra line down her abdomen, that will fade, and then her stretch marks will fade over time and become more of a silvery line versus the red angry stretch marks. Her respiratory and endocrine system is going to change as well. It's back, the respiratory system is back to within one to three weeks of birth, depending on how quickly her uterus drops back down. Um, her estrogen and progesterone levels drop very quickly. Those 
placental hormones decline as soon as the placenta is out. And then we will see our prolactin levels uh, will rise because we've had that big drop in estrogen and progesterone. And if she's not breastfeeding, those prolactin levels will start to decline within two weeks. So here are some postpartum danger signs. This comes directly out of the textbook. Fever of 100.4 or more, foul smelling lopia or unexpected change in color or amount, large blood clots, severe headaches or blurred vision, visual changes like um, uh, seeing spots, calf pain with dorsal deflection of the foot, swelling, redness, or discharge at the episiotomy, epidural, or abdominal sites, pain with urination, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, and extreme depression or mood swings. These are the postpartum danger signs that every woman needs to be taught before she leaves the hospital and preferably her partner too, so that they can be looking out for these things. These are things that need to be um, immediately discussed with a provider and not wait till the four or six week um, postpartum visit. Making sure that she is um, uh, appropriate to get up to the bathroom um, once she has given birth. This is one of the, the um, most common places that we see patients are going to pass out. So we always give good education to make sure that we assist them to the bathroom, not for them to get up on their own. And then some facilities have this tool, it's called the Sarah Steady. It's actually a great little device. If her legs are still a little numb from the epidural, if she's feeling especially weak and hasn't had anything to eat, um, these, this can help her get to the bathroom safely. So we always wanna make sure that we know what her current blood pressure is. We're gonna have her sit her on the side of the bed before we get her up. We have them stand and, and kind of march in place a little bit to make sure that their feet are going to hold them up if they've had any sort of anesthesia. We will frequently ask her how she feels, give her the signs and symptoms that she's gonna report right away, feeling lightheaded, feeling like um, our voices are getting far away, losing her peripheral vision. And we wanna stay very close to her until we can get her back to bed. Um, with this first uh, uh, visit to the bathroom. Now, once she is voided, you can teach her all about her peri care. This is a great time for that. And then assist her back to bed. Um, depending on policy, if she's gotten up once safely, typically they can do it on their own. Some hospitals want two um, visits to the bathroom safely before they will let them go. So our peri care instructions, again, I write as you get them up to the bathroom, that's when they're most interested. You want to make sure that she has clean hands before she starts, that she has a peri bottle, um, or, or sorry, for the hydration, that she is maintaining her hydration status because we want to be able to flush that um, uh, bladder out as much as possible. She may have had a fully catheter. She did have potentially had lots of vaginal exams. And um, we wanna make sure that she is voiding on a very regular basis to flush out any bacteria that could be there. There'll be a peri bottle that um, she will fill with just warm water. She's gonna use it front to back, squirting front to back for the first four to six weeks. Ice is her friend. We're gonna talk all about that in just a minute. Signs and symptoms to report again would be fever, odor, extreme pain, excessive bleeding, and then in, nothing in the vagina. We have to give very specific instructions about that. So these are some of the tools that we use. Here's that peri bottle. Tuck pads are over the counter. They have witch hazel in them. They're fantastic to put up against any healing incision or using for um, hemorrhoids. And then these are those fancy underwear, only one way to get them. They're stretchy, one size fits all. And here's a recipe for pad pickles. This is a fantastic little um, tool that they can use if uh, you're going to a baby shower anytime soon, either give them the supplies to make pad pickles or make them and you can have them waiting for them in the, in the freezer. It'll be their favorite gift. But this is the tools that you need. Um, clean maxi pads, some witch hazel, aloe vera gel, and um, you can, the lavender is optional, but you layer these on the pads and then fold them up and put them in the freezer so they're ready to go when she comes home from the hospital. It's a great healing um, tool. 
Kegel exercises are also very important. Every woman needs to know how to do a Kegel exercise, sit up straight, use those muscles that you would use to stop your stream of urine. And it, and it's the act of it kind of like going up an elevator. I think that's what this is supposed to represent. Going up an elevator, you're going to squeeze up, hold it, and then let it go very slowly. That will strengthen those Kegel muscles and um, help reduce the chance of having a, a bladder and or uterus prolapse later on. These pelvic floor muscles are what has been stretched and pulled during delivery. So other things that we're going to be talking about postpartum, pain, how she's going to control her pain, what immunization she might need. If she is um, rubella negative, this would be the time that she would get her MMR vaccine because you can't give it while pregnant and you can't give it um, uh, if she's thinking about getting pregnant. So a great time to give it is before she goes home from the hospital when she's just had a baby. We also need to educate her at that point not to get pregnant for three months after she's had that live in immunization. Talking about nutrition, again, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, lots of fiber to make sure that the bowels are working appropriately. She can resume activity, um, her pre-pregnancy activity, once she has seen her provider at that four or six week appointment, we're going to be discussing lactation and safety. So obviously this is just an Instagram photo, it is just a joke, no one freak out. Um, uh, as far as the visits, her postpartum visits, if she's had a vaginal delivery, typically they go at five to six weeks after they've had the baby. If she's had a cesarean section, some providers wanna see them sooner, so they might go anywhere from three to four weeks. And then if they have any sort of hypertension, any sort of diagnosis of hypertension, they're going to be seen at 10 days after, within 10 days of delivery. Other topics that need to be covered during our discharge teaching is going to be contraception. We need to let everyone know that breastfeeding is not 100% contraception, it's not guaranteed. I mentioned those community resources. Women need to know where they can go in their communities to get lactation support, to um, get mom-to-mom -mom groups. Um, those are essential to their good mental well-being. Signs and symptoms that need to be reported for both mother and baby. We want to make sure that moms and partners know basic baby care. And um, some places, some facilities are providing a follow-up visit, whether it be by telephone or maybe an outpatient visit two days or so after delivery. Sometimes these can be in the home. Sometimes they um, do require that the, the family come back into a facility. So ovulation and return of menstruation. This is, is very individual for each person. So non-lactating women typically will have a return seven to nine weeks after birth. That's not a rule. It's typical. So it, it may be sooner. It may be later. Lactating women will depend on how often they're feeding, their frequency and duration, anywhere from two to 18 months. But remember, we don't have a period until there has been ovulation and that egg has not been fertilized. So just because you haven't had a period doesn't mean that you have not ovulated. Um, it just means that uh, you, you may have ovulation prior to that period. You will, let me rephrase that. You will have ovulation prior to having your period. So it is possible to get pregnant. So some of the challenges that families face after discharge is lack of role models, specifically for breastfeeding and infant care, lack of support from um, our nuclear families that don't live close to each other anymore. Maybe they don't aren't around or don't um, have any uh, support to offer. The um, fatigued, overwhelmed partner, feelings of isolation, limited community ties, especially for women that um, work full time or that frequently move, maybe in the military or whatnot. We have shortened hospital stays. Prenatal classes typically focus on the birth itself and don't 
have as much as we need for the postpartum period and then limited access to education uh, from diverse cultures. So these are all challenges that are facing each of our families. And as in our communities, we need to develop ways to counteract this. And one of the big things that we can do is having mom-to-mom -mom groups, like I mentioned, having breastfeeding support groups. And a lot of times this comes from a retail store. They often sell products and offer these um, uh, classes and support groups as a part of their service. So thinking about culture, and like I said before, in labor and delivery, this is when you're gonna see culture really play out. Understanding the different cultural practices of the people in your community are super important. Um, we need to be open, respectful, and non-judgmental. Remember, these are things that come with enculturation, which is from childhood. There are some very different beliefs. Some are revolve around food or certain practices that you can do, being out when it's cold, being outside when it's windy, staying home, um, who cares for the newborn after um, delivery. So understanding your specific community's cultural practices are very important. Bonding versus attachment. So bonding is a close emotional attraction by the parents that develop within 30 to 60 minutes after birth. And we know that this can be um, uh, enhanced by allowing that close uninterrupted interaction between the new family. Uh, it's unidirectional from parent to infant and attachment doesn't develop until much later. This is um, a strong affection between infants and a significant other. So whether it be mother, father, sibling, or other caretaker, and that's when the infant starts to give back. So it starts with bonding and then that attachment is formed later on. So some of the ways that we can help with this attachment, like I said, is that early and sustained contact between newborns. Nurses play a very crucial role in assisting this process because we are going to be able to um, uh, emulate and, and exhibit ways of interacting with the newborn, how to hold the newborn, um, how to soothe the newborn. And these are all things that your families will be um, imitating uh, from what they learn from you. So every time you come into the room, remember that they're watching your interactions very closely and they're learning from that. The partner is going to start this process once the baby is born. We don't typically see it as much during pregnancy, but once that baby is actually out, we see uh, a whole uh, psychological adaptation. So they want to look at the baby, then they want to touch the baby, maybe even smell the baby. Um, they have a strong attach, uh, att attraction to the norm, newborn, especially if they can see identifying features that resemble their own. Um, uh, sometimes there's extreme elation by the father and they start to develop an increased sense of self-esteem. This reaction, is the one that gets me very frequently. If you see a father, um, once the baby is born, this is the reaction that will always emotionally get to me. So things that might affect the development of um, attachment to the newborn is the background of the parents, the infant's temperament and health, the if there's immediate separation, like I mentioned before, if there's policies that discourage exploring the infant, keeping them very wrapped up, swaddled very tightly, and um, not allowing them to have skin to skin with both uh, family members. Um, if they have to go into an intensive care environment that increases the, the um, feelings that the parents have of the vulnerability of the infant. And then staff indifference. If we are just indifferent, if it's just another day at work for us, even though it's one of the most important days in their life, they pick up on that and um, that can affect their attachment to their babies. So this is the four stages of becoming a mother. This is one of those things that NCLEX really likes to um, talk to you about or ask you about. So you wanna spend some time reading through this in the chapter in your book. And the other things that will af affect the maternal role attainment. So these are all um, um, circumstances can affect how moms um, become a mom, how they, develop in their new role and it can be 
things like personality traits of the mom or of the infant. It can be child rearing attitudes, if they were prepared during pregnancy, if this was something that they wanted, if they very much looked forward to it. We see differences in um, our socioeconomic status and um, that maternal role attainment, how the baby responds to the mom. So all of these factors may play a part into developing this relationship. Okay, we're gonna switch gears now and talk a little bit about lactation. This is a big um, factor that happens after delivery. And so the way lactation works is it's based on that feedback loop that you learned a long time ago in physiology. So when the breast receives the stimulus of the baby being on the nipple and suckling, it sends a message to the brain that says, oh, there's a baby here. And then that in turn releases a hormone and that oxytocin, yes, the same oxytocin, is going to work on the um, cells of the breast to now release milk. And as the milk is released and, and um, emptied out of the breast, it's never completely empty, but as it is um, brought out of the breast, then the body says, make more, make more, make more. So it's based on how much stimulation the baby suckles at the breast. That is what tells the body to make milk. This is the ventral position, and believe it or not, this is the natural feeding position of a newborn. Now, that's probably not what you're used to seeing. What you're used to seeing is mom sitting up and the baby kind of being down in the mom's lap, but this is the most natural feeding position for a newborn. If you want to see a ba how smart babies are, put them in this position and they will find the breast and self-attach. It's pretty amazing. So, here are just some differences between uh, breastfeeding breast milk and formula feeding. We know that formula is a good substitute, but that's what it is. It's a substitute for human breast milk. And um, there's been a lot of research done in the last 20, 30 years. We know that, that uh, breast milk offers all of the benefits that you see over on this side and formula has all of these negatives. Now, I'm not saying that your baby won't thrive on formula, but it is a breast milk substitute. These are the benefits for moms that um, are associated with breastfeeding. And these are some of the benefits that you see in relationship to obesity. And we have definitely seen childhood obesity directly correlated um, its rise is directly correlated to formula feeding increases in the 70s and 80s. And then as we saw increases in breastfeeding, we can correlate that to reductions of childhood obesity. And then the microbiome. This is one of the things that we have talked about or learned so much about in the last five to eight years. The microbiome is really what sets up our immune system. This is why babies that breastfeed have um, stronger immune systems than babies that are solely bottle fed. And it has to do with how the breast milk actually works in the gut. It's fascinating, really beyond the scope of this class, um, but it, we definitely know that the immune systems are different in um, babies that are breastfed. Now we're going to move on and talk about some of the postpartum disorders. We'll talk about hemorrhage, infection, thromboembolytic disease, and postpartum affective disorder, previously called mood disorders. So some of the things that increase our chance for postpartum complications are having an operative procedure. So that operative delivery that we talked about, forceps, cesarean birth, vacuum extraction. If they had any other medical condition like diabetes, um, that increases her chance of having postpartum complications. If she had a prolonged labor, if she had increased um, interventions like urinary catheter, if she was extremely anemic before she got pregnant, um, multiple vaginal exams encourage the, the uh, movement of bacteria up from the vagina into the uterus, and that increases her chance of infection. If she had a manual extraction of the placenta, if she has a compromised immune system, the uh, these are these are uh, risk factors for postpartum infection, and these are risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage, and a lot of those same things will apply for both. If she had a very fast labor, if she has uterine acne, 
if she had any pl placentation issues like previa or abruption, we've talked about those previously, if she was induced or augmented, if, which means we encourage the labor to start up before it started on its own, or we augmented an already existing labor to make it stronger and go faster. Again, if she had any procedures, if she has any retained placental fragments, if she has a prolonged third stage, getting that um, placenta out, if she's had more than um, three births, or if she had multiples. So all of these things increase the chance for postpartum complications. So this actual slide is actually um, on the older side. And so I'll tell you what our current evidence tells us that our blood loss of a thousand or more, whether it be vaginal or cesarean, I know that's not what it says on the slide, but this needs to be changed. A thousand or more mLs of blood loss following a vaginal birth or a cesarean is gonna move you into that postpartum hemorrhage stage. And any amount of bleeding that places the mother in hemodynamic jeopardy. So the clinical manifestations of shock and a lot of times we want to apply that existing knowledge of, of that knowledge base that we've built. And the first thing we want to say is hypotension is the first sign, but actually we're looking for those early signs. And those early signs of blood loss are things like diaphoresis or cool extremities or a mom that's feeling especially anxious. Then we're going to see tachycardia and postural hypertension. So when she stands up, she's going to have a decreased urine output, oligouria at this time. And it isn't until she's lost 40% of her blood volume are we going to see hypotension. So if you're looking for early signs, if you had a question about it, you would be looking for tachycardia. And then this is just another graph that shows you um, how, the percentage of blood loss and when you're going to really start to see those signs in those um, different vital signs. So causes of postpartum hemorrhage, again, the most common cause is uterine atony. The uterus won't clamp down. It doesn't seal off the blood vessel site where the placenta was, and we have a filling up of blood, and that blood is um, coming out. Now, this can be pretty pronounced. It's like turning on a faucet. If you have complete uh, uh, uterine atony, it's like turning on a faucet. Other places that we could be bleeding is maybe out of an episiotomy or a tear, or if she's had a uterine inversion. We see this when sometimes we tug on that cord to get the placenta to come out and it will actually invert that uterus. If there's retained placental fragments, that will keep that uterus from clamping down. If she has any sort of coagulation disorders that go along with, say, HELP syndrome, we might have um, a, a postpartum hemorrhage. And then those hematomas, they can actually be bleeding on the inside and not have any bleeding on the outside. And we'll start to see those signs and symptoms because we're checking those vital signs very regularly. We'll see those signs and symptoms of um, uh, vital signs changing and know that she must be bleeding somewhere. So when we have a postpartum hemorrhage, we're thinking about the four T's. We're trying to, de to determine why she's bleeding so that we can fix the problem, tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombin. Those are your hemorrhage T's. And early recognition, the most important part, we're going to focus on that underlying cause. We need to figure out what it is. As the nurse, the first thing you can do is a uterine massage. Now, earlier I talked about a uterine assessment. Now we're moving into a uterine massage. That's where we're going to really firmly massage that uterus down to try to get it to clamp down and turn that faucet off or at least slow it down. We want removal of those placenta fragments. This would come from the healthcare provider. The nurse is not going to do that. We might need antibiotics for infection and then the repair of um, lacerations. We are, our role again is to assist uh, assess those risk factors. So we need to know a woman is high risk for bleeding long before she starts bleeding. That is our role as a nurse is to look and apply those interventions early on that will make this part when she actually starts bleeding go a little more smoothly. We are going to be assessing that uterine tone. We need to be doing those fundal assessments to make sure that that uterine tone is staying firm, um, midline in the body and uh, at the appropriate location uh, near the umbilicus. 
we're going to be assessing that vaginal bleeding, which includes weighing it and watching those vital signs very closely. Um, looking at your risk factors, here's your assessment and management. You're going to see these tables. You absolutely need to know what your uterotonic medications are. You have that in my medication video. You also have that in the guide. If you're one of my live students, you've been giving that. If you're one of my online students, you have the opportunity of purchasing that from Etsy. Um, the link is down below in the comment section. And um, you need to know these meds. It is essential that you understand this medications, your uterotonics and your postpartum hemorrhage. We might be administering fluid early on. We're going to be monitoring for signs and symptoms of shock. And then we're gonna um, apply our emergency measures if we move into DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. These are those risk factors. So this is just a, um, taken from a policy that tells you if they're low risk, these are the interventions we're going to do. If they meet any of these criteria, if they have two or more, um, they're gonna move to high risk. But if they meet even one of these, then we're going to add this intervention. So we have a whole clot anatyping screen. And if they are high risk, then we're going to do all three of these. This is something that we would do early on as the nurse to determine um, that we have a high risk patient and then we'd have blood products available for her based on physician order. This is the postpartum hemorrhage project that was developed by AWAN, uh, Association of Women's Health, Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses. It's our professional organization. This has decreased death from hemorrhage in the United States by like utilizing this very well thought out plan. It's a protocol really. Um, and, and identifying that this needs to be put out to every labor and delivery unit and everybody using the same tool, it has decreased our, our maternal death from hemorrhage. This is one of the training tools that we use. And you can see that um, looking at these different things that are soaked, we have to learn about how much blood volume that is. If you've got uh, uh, it completely soaking the bed, we know that we're about in the 1,000 ml range. Of course, we're going to weigh it. And when you gather up all these sheets and things and weigh them, you have to take off the weight of the, of the unsaturated sheet. So the way it works most times is you would take a dry sheet or know the pre-weights of your linen and towels and that sort of thing, and then subtract that from your total. When you put these... Um, items on a scale, the amount of cc's equal ml. So if you have 150 cc's, that equals 150 ml's of blood loss, milliliters. Here are those uterotonic medications. I'm not gonna go into each one of them here, but these are the five that we have. These are the things that we can utilize medication-wise to stop um, bleeding, to stop uterine atony, to cause that uterus to clamp back down. You need to know when each of these are used. You need to know your um, uh, expected orders. So for instance, with Cytotec, I would expect to get 800 to 1,000 micrograms of an order. 200 is not going to touch it. I need to know who's not going to get methogen. You're not ever going to give methogen to somebody that has um, uh, hypertension, chronic hypertension, or preeclampsia. And so you need to know these things about these medications um, for this class and for your future use and for NCLEX. Here are your stage one hemorrhage medications and some of the uh, uh, volumes and things and dosages that I was just talking about. And then a map pack. If we have a massive hemorrhage, we're going to utilize a map pack or a maternal pack. Three, two, one is how we remember it three units of packed red blood cells, two units of fresh frozen plasma, and a single donor platelet. The reason being, if you have a massive hemorrhage, you've not just lost volume, you've lost all the um, pieces and parts and components of that blood product as well, and you're going to have to replace all of it so that we decrease your chance of going into that DIC that I mentioned earlier. 
These are some of the tools that we might use to get blood products and or fluid into a massive hemorrhage very quickly. This is um, what you would call a pressure bag and you actually put the bag of IV fluid in here and pump it up using this bulb and that will squeeze it in very fast. And then this is called a rapid infuser and you can see there's two chambers here so you could have blood products on one side and fluid on the other, and it warms it up as well as it goes down through this filter. All of these items will be taught to you when, when and if you work in an area that utilizes them. This isn't something you necessarily have to learn while you're in nursing school, but when you're on the floor and getting your orientation, you'll learn how to use these tools. These are a few of the other things that we can use. Um, these are done by providers. So this is what they call a bimanual compression of that uterus. And this is helping that uterus to clamp down manually. This is called a Bacri balloon. Um, it, that's just one of the name brands that are out there, but it's basically like a Foley that's put into the uterus. And then we assist the provider in filling this up with um, normal saline so that it causes a tamponade effect against that uterus. Again, this is the type of thing you would learn more about when you um, start working in labor and delivery. And then this is surgical procedure called the B. Lynch suture. And this is when they would go in and actually tie off these vessels because if we cannot get this woman, this uterus to stop bleeding, we are in danger of losing her life. And if this procedure doesn't work, then they would consider um, doing a hysterectomy and that may, be the only thing that saves her life. So uterine subinvolution is when that uterus does not get back down to size in the amount of time that we expect. And some of the reasons why might be retained placenta or distended bladder, like I mentioned before, or having tumors in the bladder. Um, there are some benign tumors that can be there, fibroids and myomas, uh, or um, peritonitis or an abscess. So there's other things that can happen that can keep this uterus from going back down to normal. This is why we need to know what's normal in order to recognize what's not normal. This is the sort of thing um, that would be checked up on on her uh, subsequent visits or if she had fever or excessive bleeding, she would come back in before her scheduled return appointment. Thromboembolytic condition, so a woman that has just had a baby is hypercoagulable. We want her to be. We don't want her to bleed. All those slides I just talked about, we don't want her to have a hemorrhage. So she's at highest risk for a blood clot after delivery. And even young women are at high risk for this. So we are going to be on the lookout and educate that if she has calf pain, especially with movement of that uh, foot, then she needs to have that looked at right away. Um, they're usually in the saphenous vein. They it, it can be increased by, by venous stasis. So somebody that is on bed rest or was on bed rest for a long period of time or has recently had a surgery like a cesarean section or um, has been on bed rest for uh, preterm delivery. Those are all women that are at highest risk for a clot. So some of the things we do to prevent that might be the use of these. They're either called ICDs or SCDs. Um, ICDs, uh, intermittent compression device, SCDs, sequential compression device. These are TED hose, another um, tool that you might see. These get connected to this little machine, which will blow them up and prevent venous stasis. The other thing is, um, NSAIDs, but we don't want to give NSAIDs at the end of pregnancy uh, because of our baby. And so these might be after delivery. They might use some NSAIDs. They might use some heparin after delivery. Um, and really just good education. Flexing these feet, moving these legs around in bed um, will help decrease your chance of developing a clot. Amniotic fluid embolus, I mentioned this um, when we were talking about our difficult delivery, but I mention it here because it kind of coincides, it's right at delivery, so it's both difficult delivery and in the postpartum area. Risk factors for developing AFI are um, advanced maternal age, more than one baby, placenta previa, eclampsia, if she's moved on to seizing, oxytocin administration is a risk factor for amniotic fluid embolus.
diabetes, cesarean birth, forceps birth, uterine rupture, cervical laceration, meconium stained fluid is actually a risk. And this is when amniotic fluid, amniotic fluid or tissue from the baby moves into the maternal bloodstream. This is life-threatening. It is um, uh, a, a, a emergency event and it needs to be treated um, urgently. And I talked about that in my last video. I just mentioned it here again because it can happen right at or directly after delivery. And then postpartum infection. Anyone that has had a fever of 100.4 or more after the first 24 hours, we consider it to be a postpartum infection. And it's most likely related to the uterus. And we want to um, treat her very rapidly. This can become sepsis very quickly. Wound infections, looking at that um, cesarean section wound or potentially the IV insertion site or potentially the epidural or spinal insertion site, urinary tract infections, and then mastitis is also a possibility, which is the inflammation and infection of the breast. And this is most often caused by um, damage to the nipple that can allow bacteria in and into the tissue, damage to the nipple from improper latch. So to treat postpartum infections, we're going to be looking at broad spectrum antibiotics, wound care if it's in a wound, making sure that she's staying well hydrated, and then emptying that breast um, completely, whether it be nursing that baby or hand expression or pumping, but we have to get the breast emptied because if you allow an infected breast to become engorged, now you, you can um, cause another problem and uh, we don't want to move into an abscess. And the most important thing anyone can do when dealing with a postpartum mom is wash your hands. That's still our biggest way of preventing infection. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands before you touch that patient. Encourage the mom to wash your hands. Encourage everyone that comes into the room to wash their hands before they touch the patient or the baby. Wash, wash, wash. And um, screening of visitors. This is an um, uh, important tool even when we are not in a pandemic. We want to screen visitors for any signs of infection. Even something as simple as a cold or the flu can definitely affect this mom who is at um, high risk because she just had a baby and her immune system has already decreased and her baby whose immune system has not been developed. So these are important tools the baby's going to be here where there's going to be plenty of time to visit, but coming to the hospital sick is not appropriate. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the conditions that we see in breastfeeding. So here with engorgement, this is when the tissue around all of these um, uh, glands becomes inflamed and it's often related to the fluid shift that happens after delivery and all the fluid that we have um, put in, we can make it worse, all the fluid that we put in during delivery. So it is tissue swelling and it is relieved by frequent emptying, warm showers and compresses and it, before feeding and then cold compresses between feeding. Tight supportive bra. If a mom is not planning to breastfeed, then we want to decrease, avoid any breast stimulation um, because that increases milk production. Some of the things we can do for engorgement is um, bags of frozen peas or corn. They work really well as ice packs. They can lay right on top of the bra and allow um, the ice in between, and then they can just go back into the freezer. And then green cabbage actually has a chemical that will decrease engorgement. It works everywhere on your knee, on your elbow, wherever you have some swelling. You can utilize green cabbage, put the head of cabbage in your refrigerator, and then pull off those leaves and tuck them in your bra, and that will um, decrease engorgement. Some women have breast tissue. It looks like this woman has some have breast tissue up into their axilla, and they can actually use this cabbage to um, decrease the swelling in that area as well. And then here's some treatment for mastitis. Mastitis is when you actually have an infection. And again, that's most likely caused by a portal of entry um, from a cracked or damaged nipple. 
And typically women will need antibiotics to clear this. They feel terrible. They have flu-like symptoms. They often have a reddened hard area. Again, it's super important that we keep emptying the breast of milk, even though it's painful. It's not the milk that's infected, it's the tissue. So the milk can still be given to the baby, but a lot of women find it too painful to put the baby to the breast. So she needs to hand express or pump um, this, this area to get that milk out. And we're gonna move on and talk about postpartum mood disorders. That's kind of the old term. Um, baby blues are expected. We expect to see mild depressive symptoms, sometimes a little anxiety, irritability, mood swings, tearfulness, increased sensitivity and fatigue. That is a normal process. We see these, uh, the, we see these symptoms three to five days after delivery and they normally resolve by day 10. When we start worrying that it's not normal, it's moving beyond the normal is when we move into symptoms that are lasting longer or more severe. This may lead to poor bonding, alienation from loved ones, dysfunction, violent thoughts and actions, which is moving into the severest form uh, of this disorder, which is psychosis. So we teach moms that it's normal to have these feelings. Um, it, it, they, it, they're exhausted, they have a role change, they have this new little one that is completely dependent on them. We're not surprised that they are so um, distraught over this. So blues typically resolve with restorative sleep. That's one of the most important gifts you can give to a new mom is good sleep, taking care of the other little things around the house, maybe laundry or food prep so that they can sleep when their baby's sleeping. And if it's moving beyond that 10th day or so, we want to refer them to um, some professional support. And that would be their um, provider, either their physician or their midwife, and possibly even a, um, a psychiatrist or psychologist. So this is again, normal baby blues. And then here are signs of depression. This is when it's lasting longer or happening um, way into the end of that postpartum period. And then these are symptoms of postpartum psychosis. So one of the tools that we use in the hospital is called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. You'll hear us say EPDS, and this is a self-scoring tool. And some um, uh, research tells us that this is even useful to use during pregnancy, and some providers are using it during pregnancy. But this is um, a self-scoring tool that the moms will answer these questions. And what we're looking for is for the answer to these first nine questions, here's the scoring system. If it is um, over eight or nine, then we're looking at a minor depression. And as the score goes up, we see that that depression score goes up. And the answer to number 10 should always be never. If in the hospital, they score this system and their answers to these first nine questions equal um, 10 or more, they're going to be referred to a social worker. And if the answer to number 10 is anything other than never, they'll be referred to a social worker. And they're just going to give them some opportunity to discuss these, this finding and let them know what the resources in their town are, encourage them to um, seek help early. Thanks so much for being so attentive during this um, lecture today. If you're my live students, you know how to reach me. If you're my online students, feel free to comment down below. Bye-bye.